This is CBC Here and Now. The person that's in among those 122 um, have got a different level of financial comfort or stress. Then we sit in a position where the flow of money is tied up and, and nobody wants to give. Off the job and not getting paid. More than 120 Astaldi workers with the Muskrat Falls product haven't been paid. The money now frozen by the courts. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Debbie Cooper. Fed up former Astaldi employees want their money, managers and other non-unionized staff are owed thousands of dollars each. They're still waiting on a final payout more than a month after Nalcor issued a stop work order to the Italian contractor. Here now's Colleen Connors is live with us tonight with more on this story. Colleen. Well, that's right, 122 Astaldi staff are out of work and out of money and they're owed a large payout because of things like vacation time, time in lieu and hours that they worked. But one man in Cornerbrook well, he has his doubts. When Mark Comtid is not driving his two daughters to and from school, he's here, home, in the middle of the day, checking emails. Nalcor Energy issued a stop work order to Astaldi in late October. After concerns, the company would not be able to make payroll. Workers like Compton were sent home, and Christmas is a month away. We're, you know, we are being a little bit more careful, we, you know, if there's, uh, if there's something that's discretionary, we're not going to do that right now. Uh, but, you know, a lot of things you don't really have a choice in, you know, uh, it's not a matter of whether you're going to pay the mortgage or not or, or a car payment or not. Those things still have to be done. Compton calls the money owed to him bridge money, averaging $16,000 per staff member, all with different levels of financial comfort or stress. But I think it will allow for some comfort during the Christmas season and for a month or maybe a month and a half while these people seek new employment or bridge themselves to new employment. Keep your internet running so they can look for jobs. Government said it would help cover the payout in bonds. But Astaldi put a freeze on some of those bonds and filed a court injunction to prevent the flow of money. Nalcor filed an appeal to have the injunction overturned, and by next Tuesday there should be an arbitration to allow some of the transfer of funds. Tuesday is not going to be the end to it. You know, I, I don't see how it could be with that amount of money at stake. Right now, that money and the flow of that money all rests on decisions that courts are going to make and, and with a view to trying to give both Astaldi and Nalcor fair process. So because of that fair process for, for the company and for Nalcor as a corporation, then we sit in a position where the flow of money is tied up and, and nobody wants to give. He's not banking on getting his payout anytime soon. Now Compton doesn't think that he and the other employees will ever see their money unless they take legal action, which they're very much trying to avoid for two reasons. One, it costs so much and it takes so long. Now Compton does hope to return to the site to see the completion of it and return to work there sometime in the future. But right now there is no promise of work for him. Live in Cornerbrook tonight, I'm Colleen Connors for Here and Now. Now to the latest on the oil spill off Newfoundland. It has been six days since 250,000 litres of crude oil spilled into the ocean from a line connected to the Sea Rose FPSO. The extent of damage to marine life, especially seabirds, is still unknown and may never be fully known. Attempts are underway to save some of the oil birds, but tonight one seabird biologist is saying those efforts are nothing but a charade. Here now is Carolyn Stokes joins us live. So Carolyn, what's the latest count on seabirds? Well, Debbie, as of today, 15 oiled birds have been spotted near the spill site. Five are being flown to a rehabilitation center in St. John's. Now, Ian Jones says while it may look good for oil companies to be cleaning off those birds, the efforts may be misplaced. He says in the end, nothing will save those oiled birds, not even soap and water. Ian Jones says there's no way of knowing how many seabirds will perish because of the spill. A few hundred birds could die, a few thousand, or maybe tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand, maybe more. So the upper end is over a hundred thousand. And for someone who devotes his life to studying seabirds, the possible devastation is difficult to contemplate. I, I sort of feel like I'm crying, but 
this is a, a situation where, as a scientist, we got to muster all the objectivity we, we can possibly manage and to evaluate the situation properly. And the situation is pretty dire. Seeing 15 oiled birds may not sound like a lot, but for Jones, it's alarming. Because I wouldn't have expected in the conditions that we've had recently for them to find any. There's no oil slick on the ocean surface like we saw with the 2004 Terra Nova spill of about 170,000 liters of oil. The oil in Friday's spill has been dispersed because of the rough seas. Jones says that means the oil is even more dangerous for seabirds. He says it's kind of like a bottle of salad dressing. When it's not moving, you have a thin layer of oil on top, and in this case, water on bottom. But if you add some wind and some rough seas, and suddenly the oil is everywhere. You're forming a, into a suspension of tiny droplets, it's essentially is a liquid. So after you've shaken the, the, the salad dressing bottle, you've got twice or more the volume of oily, uh, horribly toxic, deadly mousse. And according to Jones, all it takes is one of those droplets just about the size of what comes out of an eyedropper to kill a seabird. If the oil gets on those feathers, that they no longer insulate and the birds uh, very rapidly succumb to freezing exhaustion, um, hypothermia. They'll die an agonizing death uh, if they get exposed even to a tiny amount of this oil. But what about birds that are captured and cleaned? This is a charade, it gives you a, a false impression. That impression, he says, is that the birds have been saved. They're at death's door and just washing the oil off them isn't really gonna do anything. There's a huge litany of examples of where this has been done. Fantastic numbers of millions of dollars has been spent to wash MERS in particular that have then died within a few days. So if that's the case, then it sounds like the efforts to bring those five birds to St. John's to be cleaned could be a waste of time and resources. So Carol, that does give us a good idea about the cost to the environment and seabirds, but some people are asking about the financial cost to the province because, of course, oil rigs were not producing. What can you tell us? Well, Debbie, the shutdown of the offshore is expensive. Government is estimating that the impact of this as of yesterday has been $24 million. But government stressed that it's deferred revenue, not lost revenue, because the oil is still recoverable. It's still in the ground. So once the offshore operations get back to normal, they'll be able to collect it. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. So I think that's what we've learned over the last few days, that there's been a, there's a history. This project has a long history. The thing about it, that the, the history, is that none of this responds to a public need. What are we learning at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry and how much has been spent? That's in five minutes and later. I've been fighting with a stranger in the mirror. He don't like what I become. Oh, and I get nervous. From Memorial School of Music to the bright lights of Los Angeles and the Big Apple, we'll speak to musician Trevor Mile about his music. Really looking forward to hearing oh, Trevor. Yeah, make sure to stay tuned. He's a real treat. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a treat that you predicted, Ashley, last night, you forecast sun mid-afternoon today, and there it was. It, it was happened. lovely, but fleeting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't last very long. Uh, but warm as well today, mm -hmm. especially for Avalon. Yep. 10 degrees we reached in St. John's today, and then a number of temperatures in the mid-single digits. Uh, that's not going to last very long, though. We are going to see these temperatures drop, uh, especially as we head through the night tonight, and then uh, quite significantly in some cases down to the minus single digits. And uh, up through Labrador, a number of winter storm warnings from earlier today. We still have a couple in place uh, through Cartwright and then down uh, a little bit. But we are going to see these conditions improve over the next couple of hours. The majority of the snowfall will move uh, towards Nain where there's a wind warning. So it could see gusts between 80 to 100 kilometers per hour with some falling snow. We'll see some blowing snow. And then uh, Eagle River is currently under a blowing snow advisory, but uh, conditions should improve within the next couple of hours. Now, temperatures are going to drop, as I mentioned, which is going to kick up the uh, snow machine in some cases, but I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. 
Thanks, Ashley. The committee working on a harassment policy for MHAs provided an update on its progress this afternoon. The group was tasked with making recommendations after the bullying scandal at the House of Assembly last spring. Here now is Katie Breen is live in our newsroom tonight. So Katie, where do things stand? Well, the committee came out with an interim report today. Basically, it's written down all the ideas it's had so far for things it thinks should be included in the harassment policy it's creating. The five committee members held a press conference today to discuss. They say they want to make a standalone harassment policy separate from the code of conduct. They're going to recommend there be an independent support survivor. Uh, advisor, someone who can give a complainant advice on what their options are. They'd also like to see an intake person, someone with HR experience to actually receive the complaints. Instead of the Commissioner of Legislative Standards heading any kind of MHA related harassment investigation, the committee would like to see the responsibility switch to the Office of the Citizens Representative. That office already deals with whistleblowers and works confidentially. That's an important point for the committee, especially member MHA Pam Parsons. She's working to shape the new policy now, but she was a complainant this past spring. Clearly that process that uh, literally unfolded and un uncrumbled, I think is a good word to describe it as uh, before. So it, it was the first time happening. I mean, no one's ever brought something as for forward in this nature. And there were multiple members involved, obviously. So um, to, to come from what, I guess, a, a makeshift process that that was literally unfolded just recently to this i think this is um, absolutely going to be a, a world of difference the committee is hoping to have its final report ready for the spring for the next sitting of the house of assembly in the meantime it's pushing a new training course that it's hoping all mhas can take together and as soon as possible reporting live from the newsroom i'm katie breen for here and now an e coli outbreak is making people sick in canada and the united states Cases have been reported in Ontario as well as Quebec. The outbreak has also affected people in 11 U.S. states. There have been 18 confirmed cases of E. coli illness since October. Now, six people have been hospitalized, and if you have any romaine lettuce, officials say throw it out. The Labour Minister says the federal government has placed back-to-work legislation on an order paper in the dispute between Canada Post and its workers. Patty Haidu says that doesn't mean legislation will come. She says there is still flexibility and hopes an agreement is reached. But if that doesn't happen in the next 48 hours, she says the government will take action are extremely serious. I really don't want to have to use back-to-work legislation. You've heard me say it time and again. I don't believe that's where uh, uh, the best deal can come from. But having said that, this is a really busy time of year. Uh, people are relying on Canada Post to deliver packages. Small and medium-sized businesses are relying on Canada Post to have a profitable season in our economy. Needs, uh, needs Canada Post to be able to function in a, in a smooth way. The government has reappointed a special mediator to help with bargaining. Canada Post workers have staged rotating strikes for four weeks. Its union represents 50,000 people across the country. Canada Post says the rotating strikes have created a massive backlog and as it stands, delays on deliveries will continue through the month of January. Well, many, if not most people in this province, know by now that the Lower Churchill Hydroelectric Project is two years over schedule and more than $6 billion over budget. And today, some people at the Muskrat Falls Inquiry were asked why that is. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. Project Director Paul Harrington ended his testimony defending the decision to exclude hundreds of millions from the original $6.2 billion cost estimate. It's labor availability. We were very confident uh, as I mentioned uh, at length now, the, uh, the, uh, that that strategic risk wouldn't manifest itself, and, and it didn't. Uh, so we were, we were right on that. Our confidence level was high. So when he was done, CBC News asked him what did go wrong. And, and no, I'm not going to go into those things. You should speak to the NALCO or uh, communications department. But one longtime critic and former Public Utilities Board chair did have a lot to say. So it's a big problem. The budget has doubled to $12.7 billion, but Dave Vardy expects the costs will keep growing. Rising, in my opinion, probably to $15 billion. In a nutshell, Vardy says Muskrat Falls was a bad idea from its outset. 
the, the biggest issues, issue was we were building a project far bigger mm -hmm. than anything we needed for a, a province of 500,000 uh, people. And once government decided to do it, he believes they picked the wrong people. People like Harrington, with experience in the oil industry, but no experience developing hydroelectric mega projects. But I think that the balance is not right. I think there needs to be a stronger balance in favor of people with hydro expertise. Barty expects there are many more revelations to come at the inquiry. Nalcor's Jim Keating is scheduled to testify tomorrow. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. One detail coming out of the inquiry this week is how much one of those top managers, Paul Harrington, made each day. His current salary is $1,945 a day. That's up from $1,500 a day a decade ago. And we want to put some of those salary numbers in perspective. The inquiry's co-counsel, Barry Learmonth, makes $3,000 for an eight-hour day. That's $375 an hour. Co-counsel Kate O'Brien makes $2,400 a day, an hourly rate of $300. To date, this inquiry has spent more than $5 million. A local contractor has been awarded a big contract to bring their drilling rig to Nalcor's bull arm fabrication site. DF Barnes has reached an agreement with Nalcor to bring the West Aquarius back to Newfoundland. The ultra deep water and semi submersible oil rig will be back in use at Bull Arm starting in December. And Alcor says it expects work to continue until the spring with potential for extended work in the future. The West Aquarius was previously stationed about 330 kilometers from Halifax. On a straight stretch of highway, cresting a small hill, her dreams, her goals came to an end. Remembering people who died in road crashes. We will take you to an emotional ceremony in St. John's.
Well, I had breakfast with some friends from Terra Nova this morning and was watching the rain coming down the windows. And they were telling me that, that yesterday they were snowmobiling in near Terra Nova National wow. Park. I'm looking at the rain. It was very warm here. Sun came out. Everything's everywhere. <laughs> yes, there is literally everything. Over to you, Ash. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. Uh, yeah, it's depending on where you are across the province, it's either winter or I spring. guess spring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it feels this like. This is like our spring, spring weather for yeah. the St. John's area. Yeah, but temperatures have dropped uh, okay. from today, from those 10 degrees that we saw, especially in the Avalon, down to about four right now. And we're going to see these temperatures continue to drop. So if anything is a little bit wet, hovering around the zero degree mark, we might see uh, things be a little bit slick through the overnight tonight. And then current temperatures up through Labrador, minus 20 in Lab City and Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting at minus 11, factoring those wind chills. Again, feeling closer to minus 29 in Labrador City, minus 20 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And those will continue, especially as we head through the day tomorrow. The winds are going to pick up. So we could see uh, wind chills closer to minus 30 through the day tomorrow, uh, not just the overnight. Uh, otherwise, just a little bit of a wind chill down through the west coast, minus 2 it feels like in St. John's. So heading through uh, the satellite and radar over uh, the last couple of hours, we're seeing quite a bit of rainfall through the Avalon. At least we saw that everything is cleared out for the most part. So we'll see a little bit of a break in that precipitation as that low moves a little bit further north, but still looking at that snow potential up through parts of Labrador. And that's why we still have those uh, warnings in place. So winter storm warnings uh, again, and then some uh, blowing snow advisories Nain under that wind warning, looking at gusts near 100 kilometers per hour for coastal areas as we head through the night tonight. Otherwise, there's a look at that low pressure system. We're going to see a little bit of a break in that snow and then it'll redevelop through the overnight. Then the next system moves in and it's going to push that significant snowfall uh, through parts of specifically western Newfoundland, but we are going to see uh, central. We'll see that as well. Now could see that start as rain for Buren, the Buren Peninsula. Change over to snow uh, in the evening hours as that uh, continues to move north. But before with that, we could see somewhere between five, maybe 10 millimeters of rain with that system and then snow in behind this. Now these colder temperatures are moving in and that combined with the warmer water. Uh, it looks like some sea effect snow or snow squalls are possible, especially uh, along the Buren Peninsula and then parts of the West Coast as well with snow moving towards Labrador overnight and into the day on Friday morning. So here's a look at uh, just how much snow we're expecting somewhere between two to four centimeters along the coast tonight and then tomorrow is when most of that snow will fall you can see northern peninsula could see uh, some pockets of between 20 and 25 centimeters of snow otherwise 10 to 15 centimeters is a good bet right down through uh, Port of Bass. So especially if you uh, like snowmobiling, you're in for a lot more snow. That's the good news there. And then up through Cartwright uh, into Friday evening, that's when most of that snow will fall. We could see upwards of about 30 centimeters of snow for Labrador. So here's a look at tonight's forecast. Those temperatures dropping, as I mentioned, hovering around the zero degree mark for uh, the Avalon. And low-lying areas through central could dip down into the minus uh, double digits. And then that's the case up through Labrador as well, minus 23 in Lab City. Again, those st strong winds across uh, the coast of Labrador. So we are looking at blowing snow continuing through most of the night. And then tomorrow, those cooler temperatures, winds really picking up, especially in the evening hours uh, out of the northwest near 70 kilometers per hour along the coast. We're going to see that eventually uh, as we head east as well. 5 to 10 millimeters is possible for the Avalon, around 5 degrees. Otherwise, those temperatures are actually going to drop through Labrador. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. We'll have all the details coming up in a little bit. It was an emotional day for those with loved ones who died in automobile accidents. At Confederation Building, their families and friends gathered for the National Day of Remembrance for road crash victims. It was a day to remember and also remind as parents of those who died as a result of dangerous driving spoke out against speed racing and drinking and driving. Here now is Arianna Kelland was there. In honor of Nicholas Coates, in honor of Matthew Churchill, Kobe Duffanese, Alyssa Davis, Mabel Kerr, Hannah Thorne, Roger Linehan, Richard Murphy, Evelyn Abbott, Calvin Tobin, Marlene Wright, Carrie Dutton, and so, so many other victims and survivors from our province. These crashes really didn't have to happen. My name is Frankie. 
and I became a widow on April 19th, 2016. Little did I know that day, that would be the last day I would kiss goodbye my husband. It was the day my world fell apart. It's a moment we can't take back. It's a moment that changed our lives completely and our families will suffer every day for it. Randy and Shannon didn't deserve to die this way in the hands of a distracted driver. A driver who was found guilty yet only got a $180 ticket. It was July 7, 2016, the end of Hannah's third day on the job at an art gallery in Carbonier. Her grandmother, Gertie, at the wheel of a small Hyundai as they neared their destination. Hannah's summer, indeed her entire life, lay ahead of her. On a straight stretch of highway, cresting a small hill, her dreams, her goals came to an end. My name is Sherry Davis. My daughter, Alyssa Davis, was uh, 17 years old when she was killed December 23rd, 2015 on Peacekeepers Highway. Um, it was two girls speed racing. My daughter lost her life due to the actions of those two. I have a hard time driving myself um, because of being up on that highway that night. I don't go on certain highways. The speed limit, I'm always looking at other people. I'm calling them names. If I see them on their cell phone, I see them doing things that they're not supposed to be. The speeding on these highways, I tell you, is outrageous. And I want to tell you, if you are speeding and you take the life of somebody else, you'll have to live with that for the rest of your life. Yeah, very somber at the House of Assembly in the lobby today this afternoon. In other news, a valuable oil painting found this summer in St. John's fetched a pretty penny at a Toronto auction this week. Ungava Bay is by the Canadian artist A.Y. Jackson, a member of the famous Group of Seven, was discovered this past summer during the Consigners Art Roadshow in St. John's, a public appraisal event. The painting depicts a remote bay in Nunavut. Now, it sold for $50,000, and that might sound like a lot, but actually it's less than the appraiser thought. They thought they'd get $90,000 for this. Still, that's what it's appraised at. Neither the owner nor the buyer are known. Mm -hmm. And Anthony, mm -hmm. Anthony, you had the appraiser, Rob Cowley, yeah. here in the Here yes. Now studio. Yep. He was here and he saw all kinds of treasures and uh, we actually, he came and did an interview about what they were looking for. A lot of people came forward and uh, they're going to be coming back to Newfoundland. So if you've got something Maybe your nan or pop gave you that's hiding in the attic. Maybe it's a group of seven. So uh, stay tuned. Got me home. I know you're there. Oh, he left for the bright lights of Los Angeles after leaving Munn's School of Music. Next, we'll talk to Trevor Mile about his award-winning music and hear one of his performances.
Welcome back to Here Now. A singer who grew up in this province is off to New York next month to scoop up a very prestigious award by the American Society of Composers, Authors and Publishers. Trevor Mile is being recognized for a song that demonstrates artistry as well as a social conscience. Now, when Trevor grew up in St. John's, his last name was Devertoy. Americans found that a little bit tricky, so he changed his name to Trevor Mile. He now calls Los Angeles home, and before he heads off to the Big Apple, we recently invited him to our studio to talk about his award-winning song, what makes him tick as a songwriter, and of course, to play his music. My name is Trevor Mile. I grew up in Airport Heights, St. John's, and I'm a songwriter. I've been dancing the devil on my shoulder till the morning breaks. I get nervous every time he pulls me closer that I sink too deep. I keep treading I keep trying to stay afloat. Power of Heart is kind of an anthem about depression, but in the sense that a lot of the times we're our own worst enemy. It's a plea for that voice inside yourself to, you know, see the light of the situation, the optimist inside yourself to come out. So that's, that for me is the essence of the song. I know you're there, ocean flare, There's so much good music in Newfoundland, especially I'm a really big fan of folk music, and if you go downtown, I mean, there's so many good folk musicians. I have to say that I had some really good influential teachers, Anne Devine, who uh, taught me guitar, which I use every day to write songs. Um, uh, Jacinta Mackey Graham, who pushed me to do my first solo ever in a choir, which uh, helped me step out of my comfort zone. Um, and um, also Krista Slade, who is my vocal and piano teacher for, I think, like 10 years. In high school, I knew I loved writing songs, but I kind of didn't really believe in myself enough that it would be fruitful for me. And so my second passion was design. I love being creative. And I went to graphic design in uh, College of the North Atlantic. Loved the program, um, got into the career field. It was, you know, it was great, but uh, I couldn't, I couldn't shake the want to be singing and playing and writing songs. Um, I just, I had to, I had to switch it up because I, I knew I'd regret it if I didn't. Give me something, give me sparks, keep me alive with your pyro heart. Very proud to have been an award winner for ASCAP, which is a performance rights organization in America. They have an award called the Jay Gorney Award, which celebrates social change. I really put weight on myself to write socially conscious, um, and so I, I had to write a song that flirts with, uh, you know, the idea of gun control and um, and war. And uh, my ASCAP rep in Los Angeles actually sent the song into the contest and I completely forgot that it ever happened. And then like out of the blue, she messaged me and was like, oh, by the way, you won. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like uh, completely forgot. But then I was super excited. Um, they're gonna um, fly me out to New York for the awards, which is super exciting. I've never been flown anywhere in my life. So that's, so <laughs> that's just so exciting in itself. <laughs> They could have been flying me to like the like the city next door and I would have been like, oh my god. When I play the songs, I really just go back to that room where I wrote it because in that moment that I wrote it, it was coming from a very authentic and real place. It's important for me to continue to connect to the song no matter where I where I play it. So I'm just trying to lose myself in it again. When the whole world hurts, you light the dark pyro heart.
pretty good audition. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Authentic no, and real. He was talking about his music. That's yeah. how he comes across. Yeah, so. no, absolutely. And just to have him cre credit all of the teachers who taught him here. And I, and I can tell you, we get one of the privileges of our job, we get to interview people as talented as this. Mm -hmm. And we had him in the studio doing the music. There were people leaving in tears. <laughs> You know, of, of joy. His music was so beautiful. So remember that name. Last name is Mile. If you're going to look him up, it's M Y A L L Trevor. Uh, you can check out his videos online and uh, keep track of him because I think he's going places. <laughs>
The Premier told the House the CNLPB Chief Safety Officer, officer and Chief Conservation Officer are ultimately responsible for worker safety and environmental issues in our offshore oil industry. He said they are independent of the board and have full authority to make final decisions even on the operational plans of our offshore. Considering their important roles, I am surprised we have not heard from them regarding Husky's oil spill last Friday. I asked the Premier, has he heard from, met with, or spoken to the Chief Safety Officer and or the Chief Conservation Officer, and what did they report? The Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We have, my department and I personally, have been in constant contact with the Canada Newfoundland and Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board. I have, um, in, in the early hours, almost hourly discussions with them, and then as the days have gone by now, it's, it, it's, uh, it's easing a little bit, Mr. Speaker, because we are knowing and understanding more of what's happening offshore. So I can report uh, that, they, that the Canada Newfoundland Labrador Offshore Petroleum Board and its officials have been in constant contact. Thank you. I asked the Premier, what does he expect the specific roles and responsibilities of the Chief Safety Officer and the Chief Conservation Officer regarding Friday's oil spill by Husky Sea Rose, and what does he expect them to be doing going forward, and when will we hear from them? The Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. They have the Chief Safety Officer and the Chief Conservation Officer, their roles are enshrined in the Atlantic Accord, Mr. Speaker. And their role, as has been indicated, is one of safety and environmental protection. They have been um, involved in this, uh, in this oil spill constantly. They were involved last week, of course, when, uh, wet, when adverse weather was happening in Newfoundland and Labrador. I would, con I would consider they will be heavily involved in the investigation and will be involved in ensuring, as they have been, the safety and environmental protection offshore. The Honourable the Leader of the Third Party. Speaker, I asked the Premier, how independent are the Chief Safety Officer and Chief in, uh, Conservation Officers in practice? How can the public perceive them as independent given their proximity to the CNLOPB? The Honourable the Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, what I said yesterday when speaking about the Chief Safety Officer and the Chief Conservation Officer was that their decision could not be overturned or overruled by the CNLOPB board or the CEO. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, that is the role of the Chief Safety Officer. So when, essentially, when the Chief Safety, Chief Safety Officer makes a decision, that it's it. It's, his decision is a final one, no different than the Chief uh, Conservation Officer, although the Safety Officer, the Chief Safety Officer, actually can overrule his uh, gain in terms of authority more than that of the Conservation Officer. To national news now, the retrial of Dennis Oland in connection with his father's murder is back on track in New Brunswick. It should have all started yesterday, but the, the judge declared a mistrial because of issues with the jury selection. Oland is now being tried by a judge alone. He's pleading not guilty to a charge of second degree murder. His multimillionaire father, Richard Oland, was found bludgeoned to death in his office in St. John just over seven years ago. Dennis Olin was convicted in 2015, but the New Brunswick Court of Appeal overturned that conviction, saying the trial judge made mistakes in his instructions to the jury. A precocious group of students in Halifax is expanding its inspirational business empire. The Hope Blooms teens already have a salad dressing on local store shelves, grow organic produce, and pay for university scholarships. Now, as the CBC's Colleen Jones explains, they're launching a line of teas. Since she was old enough to join, Aisha Wade has had her hands in the soil at Hope Blooms. Ditto for Kaylee Bowes. I'm having tea with them, but not just any tea. So we're drinking the Happy Hibiscus, which has Nova Scotia freeze-dried blueberries. Hope Blooms Possibilities is their newest business. Two flavors, Happy Hibiscus and Glowing Green Tea. Who doesn't want to be happy and glowing? It was their Dragon's Den success that helped launch their popular salad dressings. It funds a university scholarship for the kids who work in the program. These two grade niners, when they aren't at junior high, you'll find them doing market research or designing their tins. Why, that's them on the cover. Like the older youth have inspired us to start our own social business and people were like, oh, you guys should have something other than dressing. Well, we did a lot of market research and we just tried to look at what was like really popular and like the trends right now and we saw that teas was like getting really, really big. Profits from the tea line will help build gardens like the Hope Blooms Garden for communities at risk. 
but there's more. The hibiscus they use is from Senegal. They're buying it from women farmers. We're paying double the fair trade uh, to them. They're all single moms, and uh, so we're able to help them. That's Jessie Jollymore from Hope Blooms. They're used to grow up knowing what it's like to contribute back to their community as well as impact other communities. It's very empowering and it, it teaches them so many things about how, you know, we all belong to each other at the end of the day and that we all have an impact in the world and they're deciding that their impact is a positive one. Every time Kaylee and Aisha walk into Hope Blooms, they know they're making a difference locally and globally and they're doing that before they hit high school. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax. Well, a cloudy night in St. John's as we look live at the Prince Philip Parkway. It uh, does look like things will cool down tonight and then more rain on the way tomorrow, but uh, I'll have all the details looking a little bit ahead towards the weekend. Welcome back to Here and Now, everyone. And Ashley, I know we're going to get a, a look into the future, the weekend coming <laughs> up, and the downtown St. John's Santa Claus Parade is important for oh, right. thousands yeah. of people. But uh, we have to get through tomorrow and we the do. next day. <laughs> we do. Get through a little bit of a soggy day tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then temperatures cool down. So we're going to see uh, the snow kick in, at least for parts of the west coast and specifically through the Buren Peninsula as well as we get into that uh, that flow uh, that is reminiscent of that pattern. So we're going to see that through the evening on Thursday, continue through the day on uh, Friday and it looks like uh, some significant snowfall is expected across most of the uh, west coast. And with this, the winds are really going to pick up as well. And we'll see about uh, 15 to potentially 20 centimeters of snow up through parts of Labrador as well as we head into the evening and overnight hours. And that low kind of sticks around. So we're going to continue to see that colder air right through the day on Saturday as well. So uh, taking a look at that forecast, those windy conditions, as I mentioned, temperatures much cooler down to the minus single digits through the day on Friday right across the board. Uh, warmer up through Labrador, though, only seeing a high near minus four for 
Happy Valley Goose Bay and minus 14 for uh, Lab City. As I mentioned, 15 to 20 centimeters is possible for Cartwright. So looking even more ahead as that low pressure system sits off the coast, we're going to see that uh, snow continue through the day on Saturday for the most part, eventually clearing towards the evening hours and then into Sunday. We should see a relatively nice day, maybe a few cloudy periods, that chance of a few uh, flurries through the day. And then some warmer air moves in, which will change that potential over from flurries to the potential for some showers, especially for the Avalon. But it looks like those temperatures will jump back up into the single digits as we head towards next week as well. And then another area of low pressure moves in. This one looks a little bit messy, won't start affecting us until about uh, Tuesday night and through the day on Wednesday. So if we take a look uh, a little bit further ahead towards the weekend, again, those windy conditions picking up Friday night uh, with that chance of shower or rather flurries for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. And then uh, bumping back up on Saturday and then towards uh, Monday is when we'll see that potential for showers. Now Sunday does look like we should see some clearing sky guys uh, right around the time that the uh, parade is on. So that's good news there hovering around the two degree mark and then those winds will pick up uh, in the evening hours. So for West, uh, central Newfoundland, those temperatures are going to drop to the minus single digits. That's well below seasonal for this time of year. Should be sitting around four degrees. So a good 10 degrees below seasonal minus one for Sunday and then Monday. We'll see that potential for some showers late day. Western Newfoundland, same thing. Not quite as cold though. Minus one by uh, Saturday, but windy conditions. Just a slight chance of a few showers or rather flurries on Sunday and then up through Labrador. Uh, those temperatures are going to drop tomorrow and then climb. Look, Sunday is uh, sitting around five degrees as the afternoon high for Eastern Labrador. And then into Western Labrador, those temperatures are gonna climb as well by the time next week rolls around. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. They call it Northern Hay. For the last two years, a school in the Northwest Territories has come up with a novel way to recycle paper. And as CBC's Kirsten Murphy explains, it's making a lot of piglets very happy. These little piggies are ready for winter with shredded paper mixed in with their hay. The more paper that ends up here, the less that ends up at the landfill. In our town, we don't have paper recycling. And so it's one resource that we have a lot of. And uh, so what we found is that it works wonderful as northern hay for the pigs, uh, especially in the winter when they're staying in the barn, it can get quite muddy and gross. And so it really helps absorb the moisture and they just, they just love it. <laughs> they fluff it up and use it like, um, like they would natural uh, straw. Businesses and schools are the main suppliers. <laughs> to boost inventory, a new bin was added at the farm's entrance this month, about 15 kilometers out of town, where household paper can be dropped off, although it must arrive shredded. There are also plans to add a bin closer to town. In the spring, the paper will be turned into compost for the farm's vegetable garden. Meanwhile, the animals here are getting used to the chilly temperatures, happy as pigs in paper. Kirsten Murphy, CBC News, Hay River. Federal Finance Minister Bill Morneau has just delivered an update on the country's finances. It's an outline of his plan to keep Canada competitive with the United States. The definition of a strong economy is one that provides real results for people. That means jobs, Mr. Speaker. Good, well-paying, middle-class jobs. Jobs that you can raise a family and build a future on. Well, many of the measures are designed to counter the effect of President Donald Trump's deep tax cuts and also to stop investment from bleeding out of Canada. Ottawa is offering a 100% tax write-off on equipment for some industries. Those include the oil patch and fisheries. Maybe some good news for here. There's also a 100% equipment write-off for clean energy projects. The measures will mean $23.5 billion in new spending. The economic update also includes help for journalism. Nonprofit news organizations will be allowed to issue charitable tax receipts. Dozens of people blocked Nova Scotia's Cancel Causeway today to push for answers in the unsolved death of a Mi'kmaq woman. The protesters marched in memory of 22-year-old Cassidy Bernard. 
The Cape Breton woman was found dead in her home last month. Her six-month-old twin girls were in the house but were unharmed. Police still have not officially confirmed that it was murder. The protesters held signs saying justice for Cassidy. They also carried red dresses, a symbol of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls in Canada. The Canso Causeway links Cape Breton to the Nova Scotia mainland. Well, look at this wintry shot. This had to have been taken a couple days ago because it certainly doesn't look like that today. That's a good hint. Ah, it's <laughs> so beautiful. It's really pretty. Uh, where could it be, uh, Debbie? Uh, I'm not <laughs> saying. I don't seem to have good luck with this. <laughs> well, it is on the Avalon, but I will have all the details. Really? The okay. southern shore. Yes, southern shore. Whitless Bay. Nope. Close, though. <laughs> You're close. I'll tell you where this is coming up. Welcome back once again, everyone. Just have a look at this incredible archaeological find. This is an ancient and beautifully preserved Roman fresco discovered in a bedroom in the city of Pompeii. It is the uh, a depiction of Leda and the swan, the Roman god Jupiter impregnating a legendary queen of Sparta. Mm -hmm. It's a family show, Debbie. Uh, experts say this was fairly common, actually, home decor in Pompeii. That's before Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed the area in 79 AD, for those of you who are old enough to remember that. <laughs> this particular painting, though, is special because apparently no matter where you go, the queen is looking at you, no matter where you stand or looking at you. It's like Mona Lisa. Where you stand. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It yeah. kind of follows you. Interesting. Yeah. There you go. What a find for those uh, people who did come across it. Yeah. Speaking uh, different of... Different kind of photo. Yeah. What a find this is. <laughs> a winter is. scene there. Yeah. So this is Burnt Cove. Burn, Burn Cove. Cove. Yeah. Oh, the south right. of Bay. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Lauren Lee, for sending that photo in. If you have any weather photos, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. I love the glitter on those trees. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thanks very much. That's it for us. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a good night. Good night.